as a Jehovah's Witness, you can't go to regular college to get a career where you're going to actually be able to support yourself and support your family. One of the most common jobs for Jehovah's Witnesses in our area was a school bus driver because you could get up early in the morning and do your morning route and then you would have the morning free to go in the service and then some people, you know, if they weren't theocratic enough, would do a noon route <laughs> and uh, then they go back in the service and then they would go and do their afternoon route and take kids home from school. And there were some school bus drivers that would take um, field trips and um, they would either like take the kids to, you know, football games or the band of football games or different competitions. Um, one of my favorite things was the football game nights because then I was able to go to the games and enjoy things like the band, which reminded me of, you know, my high school time. Um, and then, of course, I loved getting that trip to, you know, for a Saturday band competition where I got to watch the marching um, and it was like really fun when you got to take everybody to Six Flags um, yet they, because they paid for your admission. So I did that for quite a few years and then um, I also, because you don't drive the school bus all the time, I also worked for Kelly Services so I did secretarial work and then a friend of ours um, moved in with us Kind of early on, it was after I had Dylan. Dylan was our, my, my first baby, and when he got to be like a little, a little skunk running around, our friend um, Jimmy moved in with us, and he was a home health aide. Um, and to get your home health aide certificate through the state, you had to take a CNA licensing class, and that wasn't a long class; it was just a few weeks. Um, and I got mine, and my husband got his too, but like I said, he never kept a job for long because he was always, you know, getting injured or for some reason, you know, getting fired or whatever. But I did that for quite a while, and that was a, was a Jehovah's Witness job that I could do that made fairly good money. I, I did love that kind of work, and I feel like it sort of was complementary to what I was doing as a doula. I was kind of like doing the end of life sort of thing which got sad for me because I would lose my little patients they would you know they would pass away and and it was hard um, to deal with that but when I first was dating Ralphie long distance because he was up in Binghamton New York and Connecticut area um, I was getting to know his family and his little brother uh, Matthew had been um, he was thrown out of the house at 14 for smoking. And so during the time that I was, you know, dating his brother, he was sort of trying to come back to Jehovah, but he had a, kind of a hard time with that. By the time we had been married for a little bit, um, he had gotten one of his girlfriends pregnant, and they had their son. They got married while she was still pregnant, and they had their son a month before we had Dylan. And those two boys grew up to be good cousin friends, um, and they're still good cousin friends to this day. So that's kind of a good thing. He had a second baby with another woman who he was gonna marry. They were engaged. And then not long before their wedding, he ended up sleeping with the first baby mama and she was pregnant again and so the second baby mama said I don't want to marry you because you did that and so then they had their second child which was a little girl and then a few years later um, they ended up having a third um, a third baby and she's a teenager now. So in our first year of a newlywed, as newlyweds, um, my mother-in-law and the youngest of the Shumway kids, Rachel, moved in with us. She was 13, I believe, at the time, uh, maybe 14. There were older twins. There were the two older girls, um, and then there was Ralph, and then there was Matthew, and then there was Rachel. Okay. And the mother had hoarding issues, literally. Um, she was an alcoholic, 
and there was just a lot of times that that really hit the fan because um, in my home I had always tried to maintain a certain level of tidy you know I don't think that I'm overly you know um, overly clean or anything but I do like to know where my things are and I do like to you know have a nice tidy house but for her it was just she had trouble throwing away newspapers and old magazines and stuff would just pile up pile up pile up and she was not a bed maker or any of those things which is totally fine I, you know if you make your bed you don't make your bed that's your bed you do what you want to with it but don't let things get just so gross you know like the typical teenage room was this grown woman's room and so sometimes my husband would like walk by her room and go oh like mom your room looks nice and boy she would blow up like how dare you judge me and it's like, well, you know, we're giving you a free place to live. And <laughs> so our life was pretty chaotic um, during that year. They ended up getting their own apartment, thankfully. Um, and then my mother-in-law was one of the very first Jehovah's Witnesses in that program at Charter Grapevine for mental health issues, for her alcoholism and codependency and all of that. During the time that she was in, um, I thought it was probably not a good idea that her 14-year-old daughter was in the apartment by herself. The older twins thought that I was being way too judgy, and they were furious with me, saying, what are you trying to do? You're, this is her, a way for her to learn independence. And I thought, at 14? You know, that doesn't seem like that's a smart thing to do. Um, and I was in the same kingdom hall with this 14-year-old girl and her mother, there was a teen, another teenager, an older teenager, that would come and stay with her, and she would drive her to the meetings. But instead of coming into the meetings, they would sit in the parking lot, and then when they would get out of the parking lot, there would be all these, you know, puffs of smoke coming out, of, coming out of the car. So we kind of figured we knew what was going on in the car during that time. And then if we would go over to their house, like we would call, there would be no answer. We'd go over there and knock on the door and we'd hear scramble, 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 you know, and then the door would open it. It would be like, what? No, uh, no, there's not anybody in here with us. Why would you, <laughs> why would you think that? So that kind of stuff was going on. So a few months later, we did find out that <clears throat> the baby sister um, the 14 year old was pregnant and um, expecting a baby and of course everyone wanted to be like so mad at her and oh you 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 and I was like y'all the time for that was before now she's a mom we need to take care of her so I went with her to her childbirth classes and I was there for her at the birth of her daughter so it was my very first official doula baby even though there were there were other grandchildren of the Shumway family, um, this baby became the baby, and she became the focus for the grandmother, and she became the focus for those two aunts. But my baby didn't get that kind of attention, and it was sad for me because this was my baby. My mother-in-law did not come to my baby shower um she didn't come to my wedding shower either it was really odd like um i don't understand that that you don't make time to be there for these important events in your kids lives or in your grandkids lives so there was always kind of a disconnect there we did a lot of moving around uh, my husband would start arguments with the elders in the hall. Um, there would be times that I would go to the elders and I would say, you know, I'm really trying to be a submissive wife, but we're having all of these problems. And of course I was told that I should, you know, go in service more and do more for the organization. And, and things were, you know, as I mentioned, I got chased around my hospital room after I'd had a C-section by my husband but these were seen as flaws with me and they were identified as postpartum depression when it was like no that's just that's just somebody being a doo-doo head um but um we ended up moving away from that kingdom hall 
to put some space between uh, my husband and the elders. He wanted to work with some truly spiritual men. So we moved into a congregation where there was some, you know, famous, you know how they're always famous Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, he wanted to be in that congregation. He loved to name drop um, and it put distance between um, me and my mom and it really hurt her a lot because she loved my son so much. They had such a close relationship. So we moved into the Mansfield area and in that time, within a year, we, we lived in a little duplex initially, and then we ended up moving to some apartments um, because we switched congregations during that little jaunt away from our little home, that little house that I had um, built and made into a sweet little, you know, a sweet little home to get married in and to have babies in. We rented our house out to an elder and his wife. My husband was a terrible landlord. Like, we didn't have money to, like, fix the stuff that broke while they were there. Um, because I was, like, I was the one that was working. And I was scrambling, you know, to, I did, you know, school bus. I did home health. And I was driving, like, you know, out of the city area where we lived um, to see patients in the Weatherford area and the Mineral Wells area and Crumb, Texas and kind of all over the place. So I, I worked really, really, really hard, but it was all I could do to keep up with things. In that second year, I got a call from my sister who had, had moved to Sarasota. And she had a little daughter who was um, a year younger than my older son, Dylan. And that was Taylor. Hi, Taylor. I love you. Um, and my sister had gotten pregnant again. And she was not living with the father of the baby. She was not married to the father of the baby. And she needed help. <clears throat> and so one of the good things that my husband did for me um, and for my sister was that we made arrangements that I could go and stay with her um, during the final weeks before she had her baby. And so I went there and I took my son with me. He was four years old at the time and we went to Florida and um, I stayed there with her at the, at the end of her pregnancy. And she was disfellowshipped at the time. And during the time that I was there, I worked for Kelly Services over that summer and it was hard not being in my home. It was hard having my little boy not in his home. It was hard having to kind of like make a living, like to pay bills at home and also to help out with my sister and everything. Um, and she wanted to get reinstated because she wanted to be with us and my family. And so I went with her to her committee meetings and she came with me to the kingdom hall and we appealed to those elders over and over and over again. And I remember sitting outside the kingdom hall on the curb um, while we were waiting for them to deliberate whether or not she could be reinstated. And they did reinstate her. And so then her baby was born and um, I got to be there for that. That was a fun night. Um, <laughs> and I really mean that. Like, it's really an honor to support your sister um, when she's having a baby. And so that was, um, that was a special and good memory for me. But when that baby was just a couple of, I mean, he was brand, brand, brand new, just days old. We ended up going to court um, to arrange so that we could move them to Fort Worth and they could live with me. And so that happened and she and her baby, her little girl Taylor and her little baby Logan came and moved in this little apartment with me and my husband Ralphie and my little boy Dylan. And they lived there with us and that was not without drama. It was very hard because, of course, my sister was brand new postpartum, nursing a little baby. Um, she had been, she had grown up in this crazy cult. My husband and I were fully indoctrinated in this cult, and we were trying to, like, help my sister reestablish communication with her parents, with my parents, with my brothers, who were 
so shitty to her, y'all. It was so bad um, how all that went down. And it was just, it was heartbreaking. And so she ended up um, going back to Florida. And we ended up moving back to our little house in Halton City. But by the time we got back there, my little house that I had had, oh my gosh, I had, it was such a dollhouse, y'all. As you might notice in my house, even in my apartment that I live in now, I like lots of bright colors. And so, like in my little house before, my bedroom had a, a beautiful, like this Italian plaster, and it was dark red, and it had like, it had little like black stain on it. So it was real, I mean, it was warm and sexy and romantic bedroom. And when I got there, they had torn down like all of my wallpaper, they had taken down all of my plaster, and they had painted everything white. It looked like a hospital. And I was heartbroken, but I had to come back to that house. I didn't have the mental energy to put into making my house the way it was before. I just, I just didn't. Um, I was dealing with a lot of loss, the loss of you know, the relationship that I had hoped to have with my sister because now she was gone back to Florida and didn't we didn't leave on good terms. It was it was sad. Um, and then I came back to my home that didn't look like my home anymore. It looked so in institutional and our little pool that we had put in, um, there was so many things wrong with it. Oh, it was just it was it was sad and it was heartbreaking. So over that year, my son started kindergarten. And um, he loved his little kindergarten teacher. Her name was Mrs. Eby. My son had a, the, the most adorable little lisp. So anyway, when we moved back, when we were back there in that house, um, I thought, you know, maybe my life would kind of get stable again. And one day, I took a pregnancy test. And I don't know how, if you consider that I failed it or I passed it, but I was pregnant. And I was terrified because I had just kind of gotten myself to where I had a balance with my work life and kind of figured out how to be a mom. And now my son was going to spend half the day um, in kindergarten, and that was going to help me, like, I felt like get a little bit of my selfness back and now there was going to be a baby and I couldn't afford the baby because I was working so hard and so I was so sad and I cried and I cried and I cried and I called a friend of mine um, who I knew would understand because she had had some surprise pregnancies in her life too and she said Brenda, let yourself cry for a good solid 20 minutes and then dry up. Your surprise baby will be the delight of your life. And so I made that decision that I would dry up and I would be happy about it. And so I was so happy about this pregnancy. And then one day my husband came home to me and confessed to me that on a business trip, with a group of Jehovah's Witness elders to Las Vegas that he had had a sexual encounter with a Las Vegas lady. Now it was not intercourse. It all invo involved genitalia and oral copulation. So my husband, who is a ministerial servant, <clears throat> ends up getting disfellowshipped. They, he claims that his disfellowshipment wasn't for that. He thinks that it was because he confessed to stealing stuff. Um, but that was the thing that made me say, no, you can't live in my bed. You can't live in my house because you went and did this. And so I was present when he um, was disfellowshipped and I was present when um, he appealed that disfellowshipment <clears throat> and I told him he couldn't stay in my house. And he, so I was in my little house but I ended up spending the majority of the time with my parents because I had a little boy um, and that was a really, really just such a defining moment in my life 
when I realized that just because you were married to a Jehovah's Witness does not mean that everything in your marriage is going to be okay. And, and this was finally a time when it was being acknowledged by the congregation that he was less than um, a loving husband. And so he was um, out, and I was pregnant, and I was working. Th at that time, I had um, gone to work full-time for American Airlines. And I had this office job, and I was pregnant, and I was sick, and I had a little boy, and he was in school. And so thank God for my mother. I mean, she was so helpful um, in really caring for me, sick, pregnant m me, and my kid, and my, you know, my pregnant self. And over a period of months, my husband kept appealing to me, please, 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 please take me back, please take me back. And I kept saying no. And my son would go and spend time with him. He was in this little micro hotel. And my son would go and spend time with him. And whenever he would drop him off, my son would say, Mommy, when can Daddy come home? And I would say, Daddy can't come home. And he wanted to know. I had a very, very smart little boy. And he wanted to know why. And I said, well, because mommies and daddies have special relationships. They kiss in a special way. They hug each other in a special way. And daddy did this with somebody who was not mommy. It was not his wife. And that's not okay with Jehovah. And that's how I explained it to my son in a way that I thought was respectful. Boy, did my husband blow a fuse. You had no right to say that. And I thought, what a dick. Oh, I had no right to be honest with my son and explain to him why daddy can't come and live with mommy anymore. Because this is the way narcissists work. They get really sweet and they get to learn how to say all the right things and appeal to you. And when you are a pregnant person, you don't want your life to be this shitty when you're pregnant. And you don't want to think... Now I'm going to have two little kids and I'm going to be a single mom. And so my husband said to me, and he began to work so hard, and he said, I promise if you just take me back, you can quit your job and you can be the full-time mom that you want to be and that I want you to be and we're going to work together. And I took him back, y'all. I took him back. And I worked for American Airlines and I was going to work until I um, had the baby. And so we ended up taking a trip to California. And we went to Disney and we did all the things. And then um, we came back and I had a baby. I had a little, you know, a little six-year-old boy um, and this little baby. And um, after like a year or so, my husband got reinstated it was still not good. He was he had not changed. I ended up having to go back to work really soon after my baby was born. And so I thought, you know, this thing that I've been doing with helping pregnant ladies have their babies, um, I, this is something that I love. And when I am off have, helping somebody have a baby, my husband can't come and be at my, like he could barge into my office and make my life kind of awful. But when I did that, he couldn't come into the hospital and make that awful. And so I started looking for um, a way to actually get official training. And I had this little baby. And so I started calling around to midwives and asking them, can you train me like to be your assistant? And so they said, you know what you really need to train to do is be a doula. And I had been doing the work of a doula, but I didn't identify that that was actually a profession. And so I took my little tiny baby with me to um, doula training. Um, and that's, that's how all that started. My husband didn't like being a full, fully parental parent. He liked being the fun time parent. He only liked doing stuff when it involved, you know, like other people with my son, my son. He didn't ever, like, he loved to call us by our title, my wife, my son, um, but he didn't like to do the actual work of true parenting. So when I would get up or I would be at a birth, you know, um, it, it often happens in the night, um, 
my husband, instead of getting up and getting his children ready to go to Granny's house or to school, he would call my mother and ask my mother if she would come and take them to school. Now, we lived literally three blocks from the school, and he could have very easily just gotten them dressed, put them in the stroller, walk to school, or put them in the car seat and drive, a, you know, three blocks. Not even full city blocks, like little sm short blocks. He could have taken them to school, but he didn't like to do that. I would come home from a birth after being up, whoever knows how many hours that you're there, and then I would come home and try to rest. And I was also breastfeeding my younger baby, and um, I breastfed him for, for quite a while. So I was catching rest in little bits and pieces all of the time. But I still had my regular, you know, Kelly girl office job plus doing the job of a doula. That's when the internet first started out. There were times when I was recovering from you know, all of this crazy life, and I would get on the internet, and I would try to figure out ways to, like, some of my earliest websites, y'all are so embarrassing when I look back on them, but, but I worked on, you know, building my own little website, and, but I remember getting in touch with Jeff, my first husband, and it was lovely to visit with him, and of course, uh, he was not a Jehovah's Witness man, and so the fact that I was married didn't have a huge effect on him. And so we began to chit-chat with each other, and oh my gosh, it felt wonderful to kind of remember what it was like to be in love. Even though I would go in and like delete, 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 Ralph was, I mean, as a kid, he would go to Radio Shack and play with their TRS-80. So he was already, I mean, he knew hacking from the very, very beginning. And so he could go in there and he could find all of those messages. And guess who got carded before the elders? That was me.